All right, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Roberto Gaetano, the president of the Rio Grande Valley chapter of the Texas Master Naturalist. Thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you on the call, just sound out if you cannot hear me. Uh, we're trying out this wireless mic to sort of correct some of the things that, that we thought we could improve on from last month's meeting. All right, so we're going to start off with a few announcements I, I would like to make, uh, talk a, a little bit about some of the training and the volunteer opportunities that we have out there, and then we'll hear from our guest speaker. If you get an idea from the theme, these are photos from Lagunetas Costa National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, just a little bit about myself. When I started out as a Tex Texas Master Naturalist, one of the assignments I first jumped on was to be a volunteer at the refuge. And that's what I spent, I think, probably my whole first year. So I haven't been out there as often as I wish I could, especially nowadays, but it's still my favorite park, favorite place to go. Uh, if you haven't uh, noticed, the hybrid state chapter meeting has been announced. It is taking place in, I call it DFW, but it's in Irving. Uh, there is a virtual, it's a hybrid, so there's a virtual portion of it. If you, if you don't see yourself driving out to Dallas to attend in person, they have that virtual component. You can register for that. I believe it's $100 versus a full registration to attend in person, which is like $325, I think, uh, not including your hotel stay and so forth. Uh, for our chapters, we are offering a $100 stipend. If you wish to attend, this can help at least pay, for example, for your virtual attendance. The only thing that we ask is that you show us that you have registered, and we ask that you write an article about whatever session or sessions you attended uh, as part of our newsletter. Okay. If you have any more questions about that, just let myself know, and we can, we can chat about that further. Uh, and the meeting is October 21st through October 24th. They do have the agenda. If you guys want to go out there and take a look at what, what's going on out there. Uh, speaking of our newsletter, the next deadline for the fall Chachalaca is uh, August 20th. If you have any stories to share, any experiences to share, a collection of photos of butterflies in your backyard that you want to share, feel free to do so. And you can forward these to, uh, I think our email is the chachalaca at rgvctmn.org, or just let me know and I can pass that along. But August 20th is the deadline. Uh, we have published the August list of advanced training opportunities. You'll find that on our website. Uh, we have that listed under our, our education. And so you'll list the things that we have found. One thing I want to point out is that we try to find as many as we can, but there's still so many of them out there that there's no way that we could capture them all. Uh, so take a look at this list, and maybe that becomes a launching point for you to find other opportunities that are out there. And if you do find something, share it with everybody else. It might be something really neat. We do publish at the very bottom of the page, we have a link to what qualifies as, as advanced training. So a common question is, well, if it's about the uh, grizzly bears in Montana and how they're running out of habitat, well, no. Why? Because we don't have grizzly bears running out of habitat in the RGV. If they're talking about the migration of birds and butterflies that, that North Texas is seeing, then it may qualify because guess what? Those birds are probably going to come here. But if when in doubt, just let us know. We'll take a look at whatever presentation that you found or whatever meeting that you found. We continue to list our volunteer opportunities out there. We continue to look for what kind of opportunities are out there. And you know what I forgot to put up here? There is a virtual volunteer fair that's coming up. I'll send that out to everybody for the date. Barbara, if you write that down to remind me to do that. But it's another opportunity for folks that don't necessarily want to go too far away from home. The, the state is putting together another virtual opportunity with presenters to say that I, have a, I need help and this is help that you can do from home. And it's coming up, and I just forgot to put the slide in here for that. Uh, with respect to AT opportunities, as an example, Susan posted out there what ACTUS is doing. And so again, if you're part of an organization or a group that you know is an AT opportunity, put it out on our Facebook page. So they have a presenter coming out. Uh, Tony's presenting the specialties of the RGV. Again, anything that we can find out there that that we can share with you, we will. And again, as long as you find this that qualifies as an AT opportunity, feel free to put it out there on Facebook. It's a, it's a unique opportunity for us, especially that the birding season is coming around and so on. 
I also want to share there's a, an initiative within, within Texas Master Naturalist called Be the Change, whether it's within a leadership role as a uh, initiative to conserve our environment and so forth. So there's a program that they have, and every month they have a different speaker. Well, it just so happens that our August speaker is our own Javier de Leon. And his presentation is going to be bridging the gap, getting new audiences outdoors in the RGV. You do have to register. If you, if you go out to our state tmn.org website, you'll find a, a link for Be the Change. Go in there and you'll find the registration. So other presenters, the, the videos are out there, but hey, we have one of our own RGV folks that's going to be doing the presentation this month. So check out uh, Javier de, de Leon's presentation. Uh, the, it is August 17th, Tuesday, August 17th at noon. It's part of their kind of their lunch and learn type of programs that they're trying to do. So August 17th. Uh, and it will be curious just to see if Javier throws in some of his corny jokes in, in his presentation. Uh, I did want to also make sure to share this AT. It's an AT opportunity because there's training involved, but it's a volunteer opportunity with the East Foundation, the Texas Wildlife Association. Uh, Elisa Velador is looking for volunteers that are willing to go through the training to do some of their field studies. Uh, a lot of the volunteer work is taking place up at El South, South Ranch and Coastal Land Resource Center, which are located in Port Spansfield. Uh, for some of us, that may be a little bit of a trip to drive out there and do some of those. Uh, for folks like me that wish could, I could go out there more often, it'd be nice to go ahead and do this. But if you're, especially in Willacy County, uh, we always struggle to try to find a lot of volunteer opportunities up there. So this hopefully can be something that we can do. All right, so to introduce tonight's speaker. For those of you on the call, that was the sound of me dropping the microphone. Barbara. Okay, tonight we're really pleased to have Brandon Jones. He's the new, uh, as of April, he's the new uh, ma manager out at Laguna Azcosa National Wildlife Refuge. He's been with U.S. Fish and Wildlife since 2005. And before that, he served in numerous roles throughout the, all over the U.S., managed eight different re refuges, four different regions across the country. And I, I did ask him to tell us about himself. He wasn't able to join us here tonight, but so he will be here with us virtually. But just a little bit, one thing about him is when he's not working, which is rare, he likes to hunt, fish, and play golf. So. So, Brendan, you should be able to share your presentation now. Okay. So do you see, is it working? For everybody on the virtual presentation, can you see it on your screens? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I can see it. Okay, Brendan, I think we're all set. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, and thank you, Barbara and Roberto, for uh, inviting me to speak to your group uh, this afternoon. Uh, Laguna Atlas, both in the refuge and and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and kind of what our mission is, and and then the purpose of Laguna Atlas Cosa, and basically kind of you know looking forward to you know some ongoing um, events that the refuge will be doing, and then moving into the for, uh, move, moving forward into the future. Um, I just, uh, Barbara was saying a little bit about myself. So I've been with the service since uh, 2005. Prior to that, I, I did a little um, time working for some uh, nonprofits, um, Ducks Unlimited and Delta Waterfowl um, up in the Prairie Pothole region, up in Canada and uh, kind of scattered across North Dakota. Um, 
to elaborate a little bit more on the refuges I've worked with in the system. Uh, um, I started out in the southeast region at um, uh, uh, Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge in near Paris, Tennessee. Um, and after that, I moved to Ufala National Wildlife Refuge um, in southeast Alabama, um, southwest Georgia. And from there, I moved on to La Creek National Wildlife Refuge in South Dakota. Um, and then from there, I went to Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. Uh, and then from there, I went to uh, Chase Lake National Wildlife Refuge and Wetland Management District in North Dakota, in uh, Woodworth, North Dakota. And then from there, I went to Louisiana at Tinsall River National Wildlife Refuge in the northeast part of the state along the Mississippi River. And from there, I went to a Rainwater Basin Wetland Management District in Nebraska. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Upper Mississippi uh, National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. And uh, it's basically, I oversaw the McGregor District, which is about 100 river miles of the Upper Mississippi River, stretching from Reno, Minnesota, down to uh, um, Davenport, Iowa. And then um, from uh, from there, I'm, I'm here at Laguna Atascosa uh, National Wildlife Refuge here down in South Texas. So, um, and then in between there, I should back, back up a little bit. I was uh, served in DC role as the uh, regional hunting and fishing chief for the Great Lakes region, uh, interior region three, which is uh, an eight state region. So I was in that role for about a year and a half uh, whilst also doing duties as overseeing the, the river. So um, I've kind of been around a while. I've been around different places. Um, uh, I've kind of, I got in this line of work. Uh, I got a passion for migratory birds, specifically waterfowl. So I've kind of, as my, Career has taken me throughout the country and, and all over um, North America and in some parts of Central America, either just through trainings or jobs or, or uh, just even on personal time. Um, I have a strong, deep passion for, for wetland and wetland ecology and wetland management, which over time has evolved into the bigger picture of, of land management. But nowadays, I tell people I do all that plus people manage. So it's, it's like you wear a, a hat of uh, many colors, as they say. So, uh, so this my presentation today. I'm going to focus more on uh, Laguna's, you know, our biological priorities and where we're moving forward in the refuge, um, and kind of covering over like uh, wetlands being one of the, the main priorities, and then also um, thorn scrub habitat restoration. Um, and then I, I'm it's just folks got questions along the way. If Barbara or Roberta, if you guys want to just let me know if someone pops up a, a, something in the chat box, that'll be fantastic. I'd I'll answer. Them uh, as we go, but then also um, we'll have some time towards the end that I'll have any other questions that folks may have um, follow up wise. So, with that, any questions right off the bat? Okay. So, um, Laguna's Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so it, was, it was basically established in 1946 for uh, wildlife conservation purposes and migratory birds, specifically redhead ducks. Um, so you, when most of the National Wildlife Refuge System and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, when the refuge system was getting established, they uh, were basically most of them got established in the early 40s and 30s during the, what they called the Dust Bowl era, um, when there was significant drought across the Great Plains and the prairies. And hunters and, and you know, commercial hunting at the time was still a big uh, economical trade at the time and, um, uh, you know, basically people still live off the land a lot closer than what they do today and they noticed a tremendous decline in waterfowl numbers and so hunters were very vocal in, at, at the time and basically uh, at that time the U.S. Biological Surveys is what it was called prior to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, scouted the country in all four flyways, the um, so going from Atlantic to Missi the Mississippi to Central Flyway and the Pacific Flyway and uh, scouted each flyway up and down, uh, latitudinally speaking, um, searching for areas of concentrations of waterfowl. And so when um, in 1946, when um, just after World War II, the, at the time, the administration that was overseeing the Bureau, uh, Biological, Bureau, Bureau Biological Survey, they were told about massive concentrations of ducks that uh, were uh, uh, were down in South Texas, and uh, that's basically um, how the Laguna Atascosa got, got established. Um, Eighty percent of the continental redheads, um, which is a type of diving duck, um, have winter here, and basically the, the, the Laguna Madre serves as their wintering grounds, uh, not only here but also um, south in, into Mexico as well, in their equivalent sea of the Laguna Madre. 
and they feed on shoal grass, uh, not, not just the grass themselves, the grass, but all the shells and inverts that, that are, uh, that live in the shoal grass in the Laguna Madre. And as they're feeding, they ingest, it's obviously, it's, it's salt water and it's a super hyaline um, uh, complex. And so as they're, as they're feeding, they um, ingest a lot of salt water. So they, uh, the, the importance of the Atascosa and other freshwater wetlands in, in the valley and the RGV is the ability to uh, what they call desalinate. And so they need, they need that freshwater intake to come over to uh, basically dilute themselves and and flush out all the salt uh, as that they've ingested as they're feeding in the Laguna Madre. And this year, being as uh, precedented as it is, is, it's you know um, we have tons of fresh water on the refuge. You know, basically more than half the refuge is is wet right now or in some form type of underwater or in a wetland type um, phase. And so uh, this this fall migration should be fantastic because. Just being here since April, but talking to a lot of the the folks and uh, Richard Moore, who's been here all his life, he's you know to see it this wet for this long for this time of year is is uh, I don't I, I think if I have to misquote me, but I don't think he's ever seen it this way. So it's it's kind of a, a unique situation. And uh, I was telling uh, Barbara Roberto earlier, I was like I, I don't know how much good of a rain dance I can do next year to make the, make it this wet, but um, it you know kind of cherish it while it lasts. So, you know, moving forward, that kind of you know, alludes to the mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And basically, you know, our mission as an agency, as a bureau of the Department of Interior, is, uh, you know, working with others to, to conserve, protect, and enhance fish and wildlife and plants in the habitats for the cont continuing benefit of American people. So, in a nutshell, we're, land, we're a land management agency. We, uh, we try to, uh, with a specific focus in managing the lands for a benefit of wildlife um, based off the purposes of what the refuge was established for. And so, um, again, migratory birds, you know, waterfowl, specifically redheads, was the, is the main main driver, main purpose of the establishment of the redheads. But as as time has progressed, and you know, better understanding and science is is kind of driven. There's other off, uh, species as far as the neotropical migrants that move through, and then uh, uh, even on the the mammal side of things with the endangered ocelot. Uh, so refugees have kind of served as this really holding place for. Um, uh, not only migratory birds and waterfowl, but all these other species as well. And what makes Laguna Atascosa so unique from uh, other refuges are the other 540 plus refuges in the system is that we have the most diverse number of bird species um, anywhere else in the country, which uh, is pretty fascinating. You know, that when you come here in the, in the during the migration, um, the fall and spring, I mean, it's it's incredible to see the diversity of birds that come through basically on a weekly basis. Um, this this spring alone, when we had a couple of these those small cold fronts mo uh, move through, I remember sitting here in the office and looking out, and one day, and then the ground was just crawling with indigo and painted bunnings. So it um, it's 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 a it's a very special place. It, it, it serves a, a great purpose and need, and and um, it's very it's a very unique ecosystem, the thorn scrub uh, habitat and and the freshwater wetland complex. So the wetlands, um, you know, it's, as I alluded to earlier, it's one of our biological priorities for management of the of the Laguna Atascosa. Um, our current man wetland management strategy is pray for rain. Um, you know, if we're in a, a typically an arid arid area with about 21, 22 inches of annual precipitation, and this year we've gotten about all of a year's worth of rain in the last three and a half months. So. Um, it's hard to manage wetlands when you don't have water, and so obviously fresh water is a, is a limiting is a limiting factor. Um, but with the development of the valley and or when the the valley got developed, all uh, when the agriculture and ditches and the drainage, you know, a lot of the historical rasakas that flowed through the through the system and through the valley that you know ultimately ultimately end up in the delta of the Rio Grande Valley. Um, I basically cut off all those freshwater flows to some extent. So, I'm you know this year with the excess of water and working with the drainage districts of of the valley and Cameron County, we're looking at ways to how even during these non uh, wet years, how we can better um, facilitate the excess uh, freshwater use for irrigation purposes. And at the end of the uh, every irrigation season, a lot of the, the drainage districts have to. They drain the water to maintain their their canal system, and um, you know a lot of that water currently gets exited out down a main or one of their main two drainage districts and dumps out into the Laguna Madre. And now that as I 
as I go through the presentation, you'll see some projects to where we're trying to capitalize on the on the use of that excess water and how we can benefit it and get it to flow into the Laguna Atascosa and also uh, other freshwater wetland complexes that exist on the refuge. So, let's give you a little breakdown aerial overview of the refuge. Uh, currently, everything outlined in yellow is is part of the refuge. We're, we have a very active realty program. Um, we, we just closed on uh, the Holly Beach track, um, which is considered you know just north of the town of Laguna Vista, and uh, which also involves a tra uh, track around El Tular Lake. Um, and uh, you know, and we're in, we're still in active discussions with other landowners and to basically create not only a connecting corridor for for the ocelot, but also a, a corridor for mig uh, migrating birds. And so, and as we acquire lands that were um, in in a stage of agriculture, uh, that's where I'll talk about later on in the presentation about how we are converting those lands back to thorn scrub um, habitat. So a little bit about just the way the Cayo um, and then the, the Atascosa run across. So currently our, our two main management structures that we have run across the ref, that run through the refuge is what we call crossing one and crossing two. Um, crossing one is the main check valve, if you will, to hold water in the main body of the of the Atascosa. And what we, we call the, you know, between one and two, we call that the uh, the middle Cayo. And basically right now when crossing two and is what we call full boarded up or, or, or the structures are closed. Um, it floods up to a certain amount of uh, acreage year and provides a bunch of wet meadow habitat and, and shallow foraging water for migratory uh, shorebirds and also wading birds and, and waterfowl. Uh, you know, I, like I said, we get a lot of redheads on the refuge, but we also get a lot of uh, North American widgeon and, um, uh, and, and American pin, or, and pintails as well, northern pintails. Um, and here, here is a picture of those structures. Uh, basically, they're they're screw gate type scr structures that we utilize to manipulate the water levels. Um, but we also can fine tune that with um, uh, using aluminum boards. And those boards are basically like two by four type boards, so we can manage the water in increments of like four, of four inches approximately. And uh, normally, if we're able to get a, a more con consistent source of water instead of relying on basically Mother Nature and extreme heat, because that we get here in the valley, we have a super high transfer evaporation rate. And so with that, um, we're real careful on how we do manage the water, because if we don't get, you know, again, this year being uh, on that uh, bell curve, an extreme outlier on, on normal years where it's, you know, basically dry all summer, the water level uh, somewhat manages itself in the sense of, of the evaporation. So um, depending on each year, it, it's, it's very different on how we manage the water flows. But every year we try to manage it in some capacity to where we are uh, creating what we call um, emergent vegetation or subaquatic vegetation through what we the practice, what we call moist soil management. And that does a multitude of factors. It uh, applies, it, um, creates not only food for waterfowl, and, you know, they can feed out in Laguna Madre, but other, other, other birds that utilize freshwater sources, it provides what we call DUD days, which are duck use days. It's basically a formula that we utilize based off the, the hectares of amount of forage that we can find out there and goes through a mathematical formula to produce how, basically how much carrying capacity we can support from a waterfowl standpoint. So the way we kind of we try to manage that again with with was is through water management. And and that's kind of one of the main factors, but water management is such a Huge tool in, in the manager, a refuge manager's toolbox because it allows us not only to manage for uh, focal species, but it also, you know, by, by manipulating water levels, we can control uh, invasive species um, and without doing so much mechanical treatment. Uh, so we try to do things on a most feasible cost economical way um, to, to manage these because we're a super small staff. There's only uh, uh, currently there's seven of us uh, for 102,000 acres. And so, you know, uh, the, the ratio of bodies to acres managed is, is, is extremely lopsided. So we, we, we try to be as efficient as we can in, in the practices and, and water management and the use of prescribed fire and what I call mother nature tools. Anytime we can utilize those tools in our toolbox to manage the landscape, not only is it better, but it's also um, economically, it's, 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 it's um, better for, for the refuge and it allows us to have more of a greater impact. Anytime you start getting involved in 
people or um, mechanical means, um, the price to manage land goes up astronomically. And as you, I'll allude to that a little bit more in the Thorn Scrub habitat restoration side of things. So again, so this is crossing one. This is that this is the Ad Adescosa. Um, this is where our headquarters is currently at. Can you guys see my cursor by chance? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. So um the headquarters is is right here. This is where our maintenance shop and facilities are at. Um uh this is the big uh, Laguna Atascosa. This is the Cayo that that's um part of that system. Uh once I end the presentation, I'll zoom out to Google Earth and kind of give you guys a bigger 30,000 foot view of kind of the hydrology of the land. Um and as it flows through the system, it dumps into the Atascosa, we call this Needle Island. This is a big, huge um, uh, kind of resting island for, for loafing waterfowl and loafing birds. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a nesting island like they see out in Luguda Madre because of the predation. Um, when, you know, water, when it gets really dry, I mean, basically, there's only been water that's right here at the bottom of what we call the bathtub uh, during air, uh, periods of drought. Uh, even this Atascosa uh, being three feet, two and a half, three feet deep all the way across. And um, roughly 15 to 1800 acres in size, you know, it, it's amazing that much water can dry up um, uh, on the landscape, but, but it does happen. So, the, as the system flows north, or as the water flows north through the system, um, this Eva Thompson is what we call this point right here. This it has a kind of a, a pinch point, and then it flows and expands and, and bottlenecks out into what we call the crossing one. So, we can manage basically this whole impoundment. With that one instruct or that one structure, and um, and and obviously you know that's what we try to do, and you know usually in the fall during the you know hurricane season, if we know when's we're going to make landfall in in the vicinity or we're going to get significant rain bands, we open these structures up to relieve in, in anticipation for that waterfall to flush the system. So um, it, it's kind of a big um, important. Uh, method or, or toolbox that we have in there as far as infrastructure wise. This next slide just kind of gives you a little bit of some LIDAR data that we've collected through the years. Um, obviously, the darker blue in the map indicates the deeper water and, um, and obviously the, 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 the more orange you go, the higher elevation you, you go. So as you like as alluded to earlier, you know, it's it's a it's a big area, but it's it's a very shallow area. It, it doesn't it's not a it's not a, a deep a deep lake um, uh, or deep wetland, I, I should say. So, but it's it's very it's a very productive uh, wetland when it is. It's kind of a boom or bust type ecosystem. Um, so, in these periods of very of wet cycles, it, it becomes very productive from a food sustainability standpoint and a, a, a vegetation standpoint, and then just the opposite during during drought years. Um, the the right side of the screen. Kind of shows it more in a different color scheme phase, but it, it really highlights the uh, you know the blue and the, the the bluer colors are is your water, but it just kind of gives you more of that infrared spectrum that we see that we get from satellite imagery. So the Rosaka system that kind of flows through behind headquarters here, we call this the Rosaka de los Coites. It's basically um, you know an old Rosaka system that it, it really starts all the way kind of west of San Benito near one of the lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge tracks. Um, it it was historically one of the main um, Rosacas that um, flowed through the valley, but uh, again with the development of the valley, it, and a lot of that water has been diverted off through the different drainage districts for irrigation purposes. And but we do have um, some capability to flood this manually through a pump, which you'll see on the next slide. But with the recent uh, acquisition of the Delaney Farms track, um, which is uh, south of uh, FM 106, it's not it's not this track. You'll see it in the next slide. Uh, we do have a ability, a better ability now to manage water flowing through that system. So this is the Delaney track, or what we call Delaney the Delaney Farms, or what we call the Delaney track. It's like this. Uh, boot type shape with a with a with a, a spur on the toe as I, as I like to call it um and this is that Rosaka that runs through the, that runs through um, uh, some private ground off what we call this Ted hunt road and, and it starts flowing through uh, the Delaney farm and right now this is kind of uh, there's a there's works there's some talks now with the drainage districts and um, specifically Bayview drainage district I think it's number 11. 
It's drainage district six, seven, and eleven. Don't ask me what happened to eight, nine, and ten. But anyways, that's the uh, that's that's the numbering system they have. And right now, when the county releases water, when they get these excess rains that we've had this year, um, there has been communications with them on trying to, you know, you know, they're trying to get rid of all this ex ex excess water and in participation uh, or, or excuse me, in anticipation for hurricane season. But also, like their infrastructure can't handle it, and so. You know, we're we're here at the refuge saying, hey, we're, you know, we can utilize all the fresh water you, you guys want to uh, can give us or, you know, you want to get rid of. And so it's just right now we're trying to figure out how making sure um, the drainage districts are all on the same page. And, you know, unfortunately, there's politics and stuff. Like, well, they're, they're not there's some infighting in amongst the drainage district sometimes on who's going to pay for what and how water's going to get to where. But at the end of the day. They all want to get rid of excess water so that, you know, it doesn't fly out towns and communities further up, up the Risaka. So there is an uh, ongoing planning right now and in and, and conversations. It's just all in, in the conversation phase, though. But hopefully in the, in the near future, we'll be able to install a flow structure through here, basically kind of a relief valve and be able to pump or allow water to gravity flow through the Risaka system, uh, which will also uh, eventually dump it not only into the Atascosa, but once it gets in behind the um, the headquarters, we have multiple uh, flow structures to where we can open and close and hold water um, as as it continues to flow through the system. So this is also, uh, as you'll see later on the presentation, the delay. This is where the bulk of our thorn scrub habitat restoration is taking place. And so the ability to have uh, when we do these replantings of thorn scrub uh, trees. Uh, one of the biggest limiting factors is obviously water. So if we had the ability ability to kind of like farm ourselves, but farm trees, um, specifically thorn scrub trees, uh, that will tremendously help the uh, success of these plantings. So this is kind of the system behind. Again, this is kind of more of a topo map, but this is the um, headquarters is right here. Um, these these X X one two three four five six seven. This is showing the the different areas of um, flow structures that we have, or basically water control structures. The blue uh, dotted line indicates our current method when we when we have funds to pump water out of one of the, uh, as the water flows through the Cayo, it backs up this, this, this old irrigation ditch, and we have a uh, gator pump that we put in, and we basically pipe it through, or pump, excuse me, pump it through an underground pipeline right now into this Risaka. Uh, again, but this is a very costly measure to manage for water. Um, you know, it, it's not, you know, diesel fuel is not cheap. It's it's expensive. There's a lot of maintenance that goes to it. And um, during super dry years, it takes a lot of water not only to wet the soil profile before you start ponding water, but you're also kind of fighting the, um, uh, again, that hot, that super high transo uh, evaporation rate. So uh, this is our current setup that we have now and the way they utilized in the past, but we hope, you know, moving into the future, we'll, again, we'll be able to have a gravity flow through the system. So this next slide is showing you what we call unit seven or the Pelican Lake unit. Um, this this big wetland that you see here, which currently right now is completely full. Um, I encourage you, th those that like to, you know, or really like to look at shorebird or birding, um, uh, aspects of it right now. It's it's a nice walk or, or bike ride out along the tour loop. Uh, it's 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 like a basically a two thousand acre wetland right now, and, and uh, it's it's a phenomenal birding. Um, just right now with all the local birds with the breeding season. I was telling Barbara and Pete earlier with regards to the black neck stilts. It's uh it's pretty fascinating. My wife and I were out there a couple nights ago and just biking through and. Um, you know, we saw a bunch of the little black neck stilts intertwined in with the mom and dad out there. So it's like you could tell it was this year's hatching of all the black neck stilts, and there's hundreds of them out there just running around um, in the little, you know, two or three inches of water on the very outskirts of the edge of the Pelican Lake. So, um, like I said, mentioned earlier, you know, it, you know, this it's a boomer boomer bus type system, and right now it's a boom. So um, even though it's kind of slowing us up from a lot of infrastructure work and, and projects because it's so wet. To get equipment and do stuff, it, it's at the same time you you have to kind of relish realizing this this doesn't happen every year. This is kind of a, a very rare phenomenon, and just kind of cherish cherish what Mother Nature's producing right now. So, one of the projects though moving forward is um, again, if you just follow my cursor, this is one of the main outlets for those irrigation districts where when they clean out their systems, it flows basically straight south in an east to west fashion of the. Uh, of the airport 
and bounce right out into the Laguna Madre. We have uh, some partners with our um, Ducks Unlimited and and uh, getting what we call NACA money, which is the North American Waterfowl Conservation Act dollars, um, and get which we can find what we what they call match funds for to basically be able to uh, push water in these this old irrigation get ditched further north into what we call the Morocco Blanco area, and then further north into what we call Pintel. This is what we call Pintel Lake. Um, this ridge right here off the tour loop, there's an overlook right here called Renee's Overlook. This is what we call Redhead Ridge. It's kind of one of the highest ground. Josh will see a photo of it at the very end of the presentation. But it's one of the highest points uh, on the refuge or in the uh, on the coastline in this part of the valley. And you can see this uh, this whole system, all, all of Pintel, Pintel Lake and, and uh, down to Morocco Blanco and um, I guess you know I haven't been here in the fall yet, but basically when the redheads are are out here in the bay feeding, they basically fly right over the ridge and dump into uh, these wetlands when when they're wet, and so it's it's quite the uh, whistling wing, um, sound sights and sounds uh, early morning, late evening. So um, again, uh, quite an exciting opportunity uh, coming this fall. Moving on to one of our uh, next wetland uh, re re restoration projects that we're doing, or it's we call this again Eva Thompson Point. We kind of call this the Eva Thompson Wetland Complex. Um, if you look real closely um, back in the day when this was was tried to be farmed before it became um, a national wildlife refuge, uh, the, these wetlands were drained uh, obviously to try to farm. And so one of the one of the uh, projects that's in the plan uh, process is to you know basically get some engineering. Uh, design out here, concepts going and seeing what's it going to take to restore these wetlands um, back to their initial capacity, whether we need to just basically put plugs in these ditches or if we need to go back through and backfill the entire ditch um, to, to get these wetlands to hold water again. Um, because, you know, when we when it does rain, especially here on the coast, we get the, you know, those sea, afternoon sea breeze showers uh, just this summer alone. I mean, within 30 minutes, we can get a half inch or an inch of rain. And so they like you get that flash system and um, that would put some, you know, that'll make these water, these wetlands hold water, which I, I mean, is basically instantaneous habitat for, uh, for wildlife, not only just birds, but after every rain, the, the ground becomes alive out here with all the fiddler crabs and, and um, you know, the frogs I and mean, everything, everybody responds to fresh water. So it's, like I said, like that boom or bust system, it's it's very explosive and kind of unique to um, the RGV, but it's it's kind of a unique concept of arid arid uh, arid areas, arid arid climates that are, or I should say, that are normally arid climate. The next one that we're moving to, we're now we're moving further south into um, the Villa Grande uh, unit. There's there's two projects going on here. Um, the one. That, I, most, you, most folks might be familiar with. I know um, there was a public media release on it uh, um, a couple weeks ago, and they've been working on it since uh, earlier this spring. Is uh, basically right here. Obviously, this is the Brownsville um, Ship Channel, and then this is the the the, the canal that, they, that they're widening to 150 feet to allow for more tidal exchange into the Bahia Grande unit. That should be complete by this fall. Um, they're making some pretty good progress on it. Um, as we speak now, so if you go to go out that way, go on Highway 48, you'll be able to see uh, see the activator out there and them basically dredging that channel line to basically um, further enhance the estuary of the Bahia Grande. Bahia Grande, the, there's um, the, these islands out here where this old where the old railroad used to run through um, back in the early 1920s. Those are some of the most pr um, prosperous bird nesting colony islands. Um, and so we have uh, our coastal partners program and coastal biologist, uh, Jonathan uh, Moxigema, he was able to secure a, uh, a $5 million grant to basically protect those islands with re uh, some riprap and, and basically make sure they don't further erode those islands. And then also our fisheries folks have been doing some intense surveys in, in the Bahia Grande itself. And, and it's, you know, as the more tidal exchange happens in this area, it is, it's becoming more and more of a uh, fishery uh, breeding ground for, for an, uh, a nursery, a fish nursery. So in the fall, when a lot of the fish move in there in the spring, the the, the, the redfish and, the, and even snook and the trout, it, you know, basically they just, they get so thick in there, you can basically walk across them, but it, but it's, it's just, it's becoming more and more of a, a breeding ground and basically serving as a local 
um, source uh, breeding ground for the local fish population in the lower Laguna Madre. So it's it's you know Bahia Grande ever since you know and and further widening that channel to restore it back to historically the way it was before they dug the Brownsville Ship Channel and closed off that 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 whole tidal system. Um, just getting it back to what it kind of was pre um, pre uh, Brownsville Ship Channel is it's tremendous. It's really doing a lot of uh, a lot of good. So as the channel widens, the more tidal exchanges is able to happen, and the more flow in and out. Which also is the same with these um, these these isolated um, tidal wetlands back here, Laguna Larga and Laguna Playa. Um, I'll, I'll, my next slide, I'll talk about Laguna Larga, how we're going to utilize a, a lot of, of the, the precipitation that comes off high of the highway from freshwater, and hence that having it dump out. To, to the Laguna Madre, we're going to try to funnel it through down into Laguna Larga because it is an extremely hyper saline uh, wetland, and we're trying to basically decrease the amount of salinity in that wetland to promote aquatic growth. So, lots going on at Bahia. It's a phenomenal place. Uh, there's plans in the works as well now for that unit. We're going through our visitor services plan and going through the NEPA process to open that to the public for hiking and biking and bird watching and, and photography and, and trail watch. So. Hopefully within the next two to three years, we'll have that that gone through the appropriate processes to um to, to, to that open so folks can can enjoy. <clears throat> so as alluded to, the the Channel F project is what this project is called. Uh, basically, this is uh, Highway 100, the red line. These are existing culverts. These dark areas that you see um, in this LIDAR information are the wetlands that were drained. Again, this used to be farm prior to um, the service owning it. And the, obviously the wetlands were all drained north into towards the road and then the water ran east. So as the water, um, as the project done with the um, NOAA, uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration and, and the, the coastal program and Ducks Unlimited, they are, uh, all partnered together and secure funds to not only restore these wetlands, but also um, create a canal down to flow into what we call channel F to flow into this. Um, this is a ridge here, and this is what they, a low spot in the ridge and where water used to flow, but it'll have a continue to flow through there. So um, that project right now, is, as we speak, is um, again, with all the rain, it's delayed a lot of the surveying and engineering that needs to take place, but that is what's um, uh, going forward, um, you know, that project from the dirt works perspective, hopefully later on this winter or early next spring will, will take place and we'll be able to show that wetland complex. I know Cameron County, there's an ecotourism center that's kind of just right here in this corner. They've got a big, um, overlook pier that kind of overlooks this wetland complex. And so when these wetlands are restored and you get all over that overlook, you'll be able to see you know, kind of like a waterfowl wetland, what wade bird paradise out here in these wetlands. So, um, pretty exciting to see that. And then also in the future, there's a, um, part of the care, the, the green space network trail Cameron County's doing. There's a, um, a Cara Cara, we call it the Cara Cara trail. There'll be a trail that runs along the old, uh, the old, uh, railroad bed here. Um, it'll be a, a hiking, biking trail that'll run through. Um, and I think that trail supposed to connect all the way from like Lulu and Vista all the way over to Palo Alto and. Um, and kind of they got all these networks going through Cameron County from Brownsville to Harlingen to the Port Isabel. But, um, you know, in years down the road, you know, this that trail um, will be connected through there again. So you'll be able to um, see not only those in those wetlands and those complex, but also um, tour through uh, the Bahia Grande. This is just another map showing you more of the aerial photo. As you can see, you can see these deep distinct lines. Anytime you're looking at aerial photos and you see straight lines on the landscape, those are not natural. <laughs> those are all man-made. So, uh, you know, the, the, this is this is the uh, the ditches that will be restored um, as uh, as this project progresses. So that's it for for the wetland side of things. Um, excuse me for a minute. I'm going to take a sip of water. So now I'm going to get into the uh, the thorn scrub uh, habitat restoration. This is what is uh, part of the um, uh, the second biological priority of the Laguna Ascosa Refuge, and 
It's basically, you know, restoring uh, agricultural fields into um, thorn square habitat. And so, you know, what this picture here is indicating uh, all the trees to get in the ground. This is where, you know, when we do these these um, tree plantings and the tubing, this is where we usually seek for volunteer input and help. Uh, this is a curly, you know, this this endeavor and this effort is is, is super um, expensive. Uh, thorn square restoration restoration is kind of specific to just. Uh, South Texas, uh, specifically just uh, the RGV, um, they do do other, obviously across the country, other tree plantings, but um, you know, in the South, when you, when you talk about bottom and hardwoods, it's multi-state, same thing with uh, longleaf pine and lot. And so you've got more economic means to, to be more uh, um, venturous and getting the more acres on the ground, where when you're talking about such a niche ecosystem and in, in, in niche plant community, uh, it's, it's, it's real tough. It's real, it's a real challenge. And so we are working through, uh, got a, quite a few projects and research projects outlined on how we can better, uh, restore these agricultural fields, not only, um, quickly, but the most economically feasible way. So, um, these are the tree twos that we put on in, in areas where the week weeks, um, know there's going to be high herbivory from other animals, hogs and deer and nilgai, and then, um, these other there's some areas where we not like on the Delaney will uh, where we won't put these twos on because we there's just right now there's just so much ag there's not we won't have to worry about the herbivory issue as bad. Kind of got a little ahead of myself there, but basically, um, you know, it's one of the main biological priorities. Um, it, you know, increasing thorn square habitat will not only provide additional habitat for migratory birds, but also the endangered ocelot. Uh, this fall, we're planning to plan up to, um, as, as of today, if that number is updated, we'll probably end up doing uh, 300 acres. So basically double that number. And our current planting rate that we do now is about 1,000 trees to the acre, uh, which is, as you can um, imagine, it's pretty intense. Um, and that equates to around 35 different species. So, which is basically what the, the um, is what's current out in just in nature alone is about 35 different types of thorn scrub species. And uh, it's very intensive um, labor. It's very intensive cost. It's, you know, if you pencil that out to restoration, it's about $5,500 an acre, what it is what it costs to restore agricultural ground to thorn scrub habitat. And again, this is a, a system that's involved over eons. So, you know, a tree planted today, uh, unfortunately, you know, I won't be alive around to see it come to its full potential, but it's a slow process. So, you know, the hopes is, is that, you know, as we fine tune this, this process and the science kind of drives better our, our decision making and management direction um, for the generations that come after us, you know, they kind of have a, a well planned roadmap, if you will, um, or blueprints that will kind of keep things in the right direction. And also, obviously, as new new science comes along and, and better to provide better information on better ways to do it, um, hopefully expedite the process even further. So just some of the tree species, I didn't I didn't want to list the whole litany of them, but, you know, snake eyes is a tree that we get planted. I try to pick out some of the cool ones and the neat ones. I think they're, they're pretty, you know, once you see them, it's kind of like not mistaken that that's what that is. But snake eyes is a tree we utilize. The green, you know, or spiny hackberries, you know, those are the ones when you pick them, they get real ripe. They kind of taste like cantaloupe. So if you can get to them for the birds do, they're a yummy snack out on the trail. Uh, the other one is brazier, uh, what we call blue wood, another berry type bush that grows. Um, and again, you know, this serves as a, as a, um, the, the way thorn scrub initially kind of evolved was through what they call the clumping method. So as a tree was able to outcompete other other trees or other grasses as it got to maturity and it started producing the fruit of these these seeds is basically is basically spread by birds so as these birds consume the this the fruit or the seed and it passes through the digestive system they get in the trees and basically they poop out the seed and it drops on near the ground and, and so basically this the tree spreads out you have what they call a host tree in in this clumping method and it'll spread out from the host tree and before you know it, you have this thick uh, canopy of thorn scrub type habitat. Another one of the trees that we get is the, the mazanita. Um, it's a, 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 again another berry producing type tree. Um, you know, has this pink flower that it produces and eventually involves into uh, the red color that you see. And for this year, this is kind of give you a, a little bit aerial photo of the, um, the sites that we're we're planning on planting the the, the 
site in yellow, outlined in yellow. That's what we did earlier this spring. The stuff outlined in red is what we're planning to do this fall. Uh, and, you know, as long as the growers and, and everything kind of works out, we um, will have most of the stuff planted by contract crews. Um, and then uh, and then the areas that are close to the risk or areas from a buffer zone is if we have funds to allocate them to, we will do uh, the tree tubing on it. So, um, and just kind of give you an idea. So, like I told you, you know, Delaney is roughly a little over 20, 22, 2300 acres and at a thousand trees to the acre, it's a, you know, it's a slow going process to say the least. And I, I don't know where we're on time, but I, I'm gonna leave it there. I, I could keep going down the road a little bit more, but I, that's just kind of the, I just want to give you guys the big broad overview and um, of kind of where you know the refuge habitat management wise, where our focuses are. This picture, this picture is that picture I was alluding to earlier with Redhead Ridge. Um, this is Laguna Madre. You can actually stand here at Renee's Overlook and look over. And this to the left is the Pentel Lake, which right now this was taken earlier this year before all the rain, but um, this is this is uh, pretty wet and vegetated right now, but. Um, that, that's kind of the overview presentation in the 30,000 foot view of, um, you know, what the, what the refuge is doing, where we're going, what we're doing for wildlife conservation. Um, there's always the, um, the, all the other hats that we, that I wear as a refuge manager, but you know, this is my bread and butter. This is what our main focus is. is and this is, you know, working with different partners throughout the RGV and up and down the coast. Um, this is kind of like. The, again, the meat and potatoes of of what Laguna Atas Coast's purpose is and what we do here on the refuge. And with that, I will take questions. If I didn't already skip over a bunch for people in that were asking them along the way, if I did, I apologize. Uh, yes, Brandon, I was wondering if uh, when will you open the the vis if if the way to uh, visitor center is going to be open this fall, and also for the the tram and the and the um, is there any of, of that uh, um, activities for for visitors that if you're going to have any of that? Yeah, so the visitor center, um, unfortunately, you know, uh, the call this week that I had, you know, there was talks about the you know opening stuff back up this October, but. Um, with the change in the COVID policies and stuff that, that that's kind of gotten pushed back further. So I, I really don't have a timeline as, as to when the uh, visitor center will reopen. Um, you know, the, the, the refuge is open now, to, you know, it's still open to the public. We're not charging, you know, entry fees or anything currently at the moment. It is open the like the tour, um, the, the Steve Thompson wildlife drive and stuff. All that stuff is open in currently to, you know, hikers and bikers and, uh, the trail systems are open, so the refuge is still accessible to to um, the, to the public and those folks that you know um, want to want to get out and look and see the refuge. Uh, for the tours and tram stuff, you know, due to, uh, to you know again with COVID and the change in policies, um, you know, the refuge itself, you know, will not be doing any more um, tours that are sponsored by the refuge. Uh, you know, Laguna Atas Coast. Uh, is now an independent uh, standalone refuge. It's no longer part of the uh, South Texas Refuge Complex. So we will, um, you know, basically again, like I told you, we, we, our staff is greatly reduced in our capacity and our main driving focus is, is now habitat and land management. But, you know, those commercial operations that that do provide tours and stuff, we do we still do permit that stuff through our permitting process and still allow, allow those. And so, and our friends group, they, they'll, they're still looking at ways that they can provide those stuff. But as far as refuge, Staff and refuge employees sponsoring those events; those those are no longer um, no longer offered at, at the refuge. Brandon, I have a question. Um, do you foresee at any time in the future access to the Bayside Loop uh, with vehicles or down through the that new access on the Steve Thompson area? I know I think bikes are allowed in there and walk hiking, but I was wondering about vehicles. Yes, um, so we are, uh, so the reason it's not open now is because there was, um, you know, prior to my arrival here, my understanding there was some 
issues with the with the contractor that had had, had uh, received the bid for that job. I mean, because that that whole the whole loop and everything was supposed to be that, in, including with some of the parking lot stuff around the VC was supposed to be reasphalted and redone. But there was some um, issues with that particular contractor that um, basically, to, for all intents and purposes, he violated a lot of the contract, and so. They had to cancel that contractor and basically fire that contractor uh, off the contract. And um, unfortunately, when they did that in the midst of, of the contract, because the entrance road, the Buena Vista road, the new the part that did get done with, um, that was the only part, uh, unfortunately, that it was able to get somewhat completed. And the tour loop, I mean, there's still some of the barriers and all that stuff uh, material-wise still here, but, um, Again, the contractor just failed to hold up to the end of the of the of the contract, and so they canceled it. And so, the money that was obligated for that, they reallocated that to uh, other refuges in the region um, at that time. But so that's why the refuge, that's why the tulip is not open now. If it was, it would it would be if they were able to complete that project. But um, I, we are, as far as Laguna, you know, I've been working with our regional leadership, and and they are over aware. So. Um, I did hear some traction earlier today that there might have been some type of infrastructure bill passed. So um, if that is the case, at least I just on the Senate side of things, but if the House ends up passing that, then there will, there will be obviously some money coming down the pipe for that. And um, it is very well known and very well, uh, I guess, um, advertised that, you know, we need to complete that Steve Thompson Wildlife Drive and, and complete that project so that it can be reopened back to vehicle traffic. So it won't be necessary a loop anymore there'll be a little bit of redesign to it so that there won't be any more ocelot mortalities along the drive but um i just can't speak to the timing of that because i don't i don't have the the magic eight ball when we're going to get allocated the money to do that i mean it's going to it's the, the the remaining money needed to complete that project is 10 million dollars and so um as soon as we're able to to complete you know get those receive those funds and get that contract awarded um yeah that's that that's when it will we'll reopen to vehicle traffic. Any more questions? <laughs> Do you have female? Uh, snake eyes, and if yes, would you save a few for us? Uh, difficult to get. <laughs> us too. The, the our growers and stuff. They're they're a hard tree to plant or propagate. No doubt. I'm sure that you're aware that most of us were already trained in in most of these things you showed us. But I'm glad that you are doing this and well, welcome to your new role. Um, I was wondering, since you know about this other Risaka that you featured, um, if you're uh, working at the um, IWC, we often go to the International Boundary and Waters Commission. And um, uh -huh. I, have, I wonder what you can do uh, as you work with them, help us also with the public policy issue of protection from the two planned LNG plants and the SpaceX debris and the coming huge, huge window rattling launches that SpaceX is going to do at Boca Chica Beach. Um, we're really glad that you're uh, that you opened up the Bahia Grande lands and um, I wondered off since we monitor the construction sites on 48. I'm wondering where would we access that that Bahia Grande, the new area? Because I would really like to use that. So it's a bunch of questions, but I know you can't take a, a partisan political stance, but certainly it's a matter of public policy that we protect this precious area, the upland lomas, and all of the area around the Brownsville Ship Channel, just south and um, east of the Bahia Grande. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I kind of didn't catch the first part. You're kind of breaking up on me a little bit, but to that latter part of your question, so as stuff as far as the the stuff south of the Brownsville Ship Channel, dealing with Boca Chica and SpaceX, uh, 
fortunately from from a job management stress standpoint I, that is not uh under my kind of authority that's that's handled out of our um lower rio grande valley as part of lower lower, lower rio grande valley national wildlife refuge and, and the uh santa Ana, so that, well, like referred to the south texas refuge complex and that's managed out of uh, the alamo office um so i can't really speak to what you know uh, kind of the parameters i know that they're in you know they coordination meetings with SpaceX constantly and, and doing with the, you know, mitigation measures and fault making sure they're following all the, the environmental policies and regulations. But as far as my role directly in that, I, I'm, I'm not on those, I'm not privy to any of those conversations or any of that matter. It, as far as the Vigia Grande, it's not open yet. I mean, we are going through the process to, um, to, to get it open. Um, I just don't have a timeline on that right now. Like, again, I'm, I'm down to two staff people, one of those being our visitor services manager. Who kind of oversees the visitor services plan and the, vis and the visitor services, and um, and just going through the the environmental assessment and the NEPA process to op to, to open it. Um, I'm hopeful that within the next two years or so it will be open. But as far as accessing that, you know, that'll be in that plan in those areas. There'll be uh, two points off Highway 48. What we call we call them the Red Gate and the Yellow Gate. There's some areas right there that'll park. But uh, as we're able to go get those areas. Um, as we get it open, hopefully what we, we do have stuff in what we call our infrastructure um, strategic refuge infrastructure facilities plan. And basically that's the plan that we submit um, that goes through to help um, secure uh, funding as it comes down to basically put better amenities or build better parking lots and restrooms and that type of stuff. But, you know, yeah, the tough part about the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, you know, we're we're I always like to say we're like the little fish or the little minnow in 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 the, in the big sea when it when, we, when it comes with our agency competing with 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 uh, with government funds because you've got you know the 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 Park National Park Service and Bureau of Land Management and, and and all these other bigger land management agencies with more personnel and and more people and and so. By the time the the cookie crumbles all the way down to us, we we, we get just a nibble, and so um, and then you try to spread that across the whole country, five hundred and you know fifty something refuges, and then each region competing. And it's it's kind of a it's, it's definitely a you know very competitive, and so but we you know we do what we can to to get what we, you know to try to get secure those those outside funding, but um, these you know the projects they're just they're not cheap, uh, it's not at the government price tag, so we try to um, you know, get everything we can to to make our case, and then hope hope that the money comes through to get those projects. But um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of the story in the Bahia Grande. And I apologize, I did not catch the first part of of your your question. Any other questions from the room? Any questions from folks online? Uh, question from Caroline, are you still using volunteers? Question again. Are you still using volunteers, either local people or those who stay on the refuge? Uh, yeah, yes, we are. Um, you know, the capacity give again with the, uh, you know, the COVID, um. Pandemic that we're currently in and the, uh, the, the amount of volunteers, we're still limited on how many we can we can do, but. It, or they're actually physically staying on the refuge. Um, but, you know, as far as projects that, uh, that where we can get volunteers or we need volunteer help, um, you know, especially with some of the, the habitat projects as I previously mentioned with the thorn scrub stuff. Uh, yeah, usually when we do that, we kind of put out uh, a media blitz of recruiting volunteers that are interested or who want to help with those efforts. Uh, we have one clarification question. It reads, I may have been mistaken, but thought that vehicles aside from the tram were intentionally being limited, prohibited from the loop. Would you clarify that please? Yeah, so currently no V no vehicle traffic is is permitted on the loop, but in, in the, um, in the future, when it does, when it is able to be reopened, uh, once we're able to get the money to, to redo it and, and basically. 
finish the project, uh, it will be reopened back up. All right, I see no more questions. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate your presentation. Thank you guys, appreciate it. And for everyone uh, here and everyone online, thank you guys for, for attending and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. One, one, last mo one last thing real quick. Sorry, Tony. Just real quick, because we're running out of time. We have somebody who breached uh, her 100 hours. I guess it was back in, that's back in May. Um, but she wasn't able to, of course, come and get her pin. But finally, she's here this evening. So I'd like to present her with her 100 hour pin. Congratulations. I'm sorry. That was Bet that was Betsy Hossick from the twenty twenty one class.